turning our Bibles again this evening uh, to 1 Peter and chapter 2, uh, looking at the, the next paragraph in this second chapter, uh, verses number 4 to 8, and that new simile, a second simile, then that of being living stones. The Hills Are Alive is a line from a song in the famous musical, The Sound of Music. And if we thought too literally about this line, the hills are alive, we would consider the composer mad and listen to no further of the musical. For we know that in the real world, hills are not alive. They do not literally speak, walk, or see. They are big lumps of inanimate matter. And yet we love the song and we understand the sentiment being conveyed by it. We get that it is a metaphor, a metaphor that resonates with us. In that musical production and in our own experience, the hills have truly seemed to speak to us. As we have driven or walked through the more mountains on occasion, those inanimate lumps have spoken to us about serenity about peace, about silence, about how small we are, about how weak we are, about how wonderful the world is, about how great our God is. And we have come home refreshed and uplifted, not just from the fresh air of an open window or from having our roof down or from the benefit of a cardiac workout from a trek round the silent valley or along the morn wall. But from that conversation that we seem to have had with the hills. And it's this class of literature that we come to now in considering this picture of a Christian as a living stone. This picture, as we've said, is the second of three pictures in chapter 2, verses 1 to 12 of a Christian. We have noted already the progress from theology in chapter 1 to practice in chapters 2 to 4, 2 to 5. Chapter 1 is about what God has made us. Chapters 2 to 5 are about how we live as those remade people. And that is a right and important order for us. Theology first, practice second, doctrine first, duty building on that redemptive doctrine. We get depressed, we get frustrated, we get discouraged when we skip chapter one and plunge straight into chapter two. When we focus on our duty and forget our doctrine, there is an argument for seeing that these three similes are carefully chosen to describe and illustrate three areas of the Christian life. Infants, stones, immigrants. It seems like there's a, an ever-widening circle here, doesn't it? The first simile is about our, our personal living before the sermon and before our Bible in our devotions. The second is wider in congregational living as we'll see this evening. We're living stones in a spiritual house. And the third is even wider than that. It's about living in the world as strangers, as, as immigrants, as foreigners. And thus... This ever-widening set of relationships is set out for us here in these three similes. They're above culture, above the mores of any society. They're timeless illustrations which can be carried into any area in our world. Immigrants, infants, stones. Have you asked or wondered where a simile like this might have come from in Peter's mind? 
The simile we thought of this morning perhaps is is harder to, to identify the origin of it. Did he witness women carrying their children along the streets of Rome? Did he hear infants crying in the the church services in his congregation or imagine infants in the congregations that he was writing to? And and this drew from him this pertinent illustration of hungering after God's word. But this one, perhaps, is easier to understand its origin, trace its origin. Maybe his congregation in Rome were extending their building and stones were a common topic of conversation, an image often before the redeemed group. Perhaps there was a pile of boulders out in the car park that they all had to walk around as they entered the sanctuary. Or maybe he had heard of the congregations in Turkey to which he was writing And they were extending their premises for youth work or for a bigger sanctuary because of people joining the congregation and as a corrective to them. He writes not about bricks and mortar, but about the true essence and identity of the Christian church. The living stones built upon the foundation, the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. Or perhaps a link in Peter's mind as to that moment, perhaps an embarrassing moment that he and the other 11 disciples experienced one day as they came out of Jerusalem and saw the temple buildings and the large stones in the foundation of the temple recorded in Matthew 24. And you remember that the the disciples drew the the attention, and we were reading about these in 1 Kings 7, they drew the attention of Jesus to these big stones in the base of the temple. Legend has it, and it was that legend that underpinned their thinking that day that, that these stones were remnants from the temple of Solomon. Though the temple had been burned down by the Babylonians and, and overrun by their enemies, yet that had been preserved in God's providence, these massive stones in the base of the wall of the temple. But Jesus poured cold water onto their enthusiasm for these ancient massive relics. And he announced to them that shortly the temple would be destroyed and that what mattered more than bricks and mortar was the building of the spiritual church by the exalted King Jesus. And perhaps it's that corrective that Peter never forgot that that he brings here and lies behind this emphasis on living stones, that the attention wasn't to be on any buildings that might be put up or, or, or purchased, but rather on the spiritual progress of the listeners. Writers, favor a a link to something in Peter's, another thing in Peter's personal life right at the beginning of his discipleship. It was to the moment recorded in John 1, 42, when Jesus changed his name. Jesus said to him, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means a stone. And Jesus was announcing there that he was going to change Peter's character, that he was going to make him into someone stable, someone reliable, someone dependable. And it seems that that Peter is, is taking that moment, his experience, and he's widening it out to apply to every Christian that all of us, by the transforming grace of Christ, are living stones in the spiritual house of the church. And so we come to think of this second simile in in this trilogy of similes in, in the beginning of this second chapter. And we want to think Uh, this evening of the features well done Rachel Rachel's 
uh, learning the ropes here. Uh, so, there you go. so, well done, Rachel. Features uh, of, the living, of living stones, the formation of living stones, and the foundation uh, of, of living stones. First of all, the, the features of living stones. And there's three aspects uh, as we linger over this, this, this initial symbolism uh, of the stones that, 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 that are highlighted for us. Lustiness, life, and likeness. Lustiness, life, and likeness. Lustiness or strength, that's the property of a stone. Far harder than metal, though more brittle. The stone often ignores hits that may dent the metal. And this is the idea conveyed by this simile. The basic point here is not that a Christian is a tomato that we can crush in our fingers or can be crushed or a branch that can easily be snapped by someone's hands, but we're a stone that is strong, made strong by Christ, that is solid, that is heavy. This was Jesus' meaning to Peter, as we have said, when he described him, your your name is Simon, but you shall be called Cephas or Peter, which means a stone, someone dependable, someone strong, someone weighty, no pushover, strong in faith, Strong in commitment, strong in withstanding the heresies of his time, I will make you a stone. He would go nowhere, but would remain in place to lead and to serve the people of God. He would reject the allure of wealth, of fame, and of power. To remain a humble servant of God and of the church. A stone of strength and stability. A second feature of these stones is that they're living stones. Wayne Grudem describes this description as a daring metaphor. And we understand this point. It is a daring metaphor. A living stone. It sounds like an oxymoron. We normally connect stones with lifelessness, as dead as a stone, or stone dead, we say. The boxer in the ring, knocked out, just falls over and and makes no attempt to, to protect himself. He drops like a stone, we say. Perhaps his meaning here is that once we were spiritually like a dead stone, But now we've been made alive by the Spirit of Christ. Last week we thought of Patrick's comment about himself describing himself as a stone lying in the mud. But Jesus lifted him up and he became a living stone. And all of us who are Christians have been made alive by the Lord Jesus But there's a third dimension of this simile that that he uses here, and it's, it's the likeness. The lustiness of the stone, the life of the stone, the likeness of the stone. A small word is missing in the ESV translation at the beginning of verse number five. It is the word also. So we should read verse 5 also. You yourselves like living stones. And it's an important point. Because that small word connects the metaphor to someone else. In verse 4. It's describing the Lord Jesus in the very same term. You come to him. Him, the Lord Jesus, a living stone. Rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, he's the living stone. He was dead once, but he is resurrected now. 
He was rejected and despised and crucified, but he's alive. He is a living stone at God's right hand, stable, firm, solid in his love, in his commitment, in his power, in his kingdom. And also, you yourselves are living stones. And Peter links us, parallels us to the Lord Jesus. He's a living stone. And you yourselves are living stones as well. He died and rose again physically. We were dead and are made alive spiritually. His experience underpins, parallels, and energizes our transformative experience. A runner running across America likened himself to Forrest Gump, who did a, a, well, a similar thing in the famous film starring Tom Hanks. And to emphasize his parallelism to Tom Hanks and Forrest Gump, Pictures appeared of this runner with a long beard, a red hat, and standing on a bridge. Something which Tom Hanks was pictured as doing with his red hat, his long beard, and standing on the bridge. There they were. Tom Hanks and this runner running across America, side by side. And here we are. Christ is the living stone. You also are living stones. Are we living up to this metaphor or simile? Are we like a stone? Has Christ so transformed us that our family would describe us as a stone? Are we dependable, reliable, Steady. Do we turn up? Do we keep our word? Do we say in an elders or deacons meeting, I'll do this, and do we do it? Do we say one thing in a church discussion, but another thing outside of the church discussion? Are we reliable, dependable, steady? Are we strong in our godliness? We are to be like babies in some regards and grow, but we are also to be the same, unchanging people like a stone in other regards, not crumbling, but remaining. That's the irony here and the usefulness of studying these similes in parallel. In some ways, we're to be changing like newborn babies. In other ways, Or to be like stones and to remain the same. In our last Bible class, we studied the doctrine of the immutability of God. And we considered how he does not change and cannot change. He's the perfect being. He cannot get better and he cannot decrease in any way. And theologians have classified this attribute of God's immutability as an incommunicable attribute. And we acknowledge that it will not be until heaven that we will have that attribute of immutability in powerful measure. But in some measure, this simile is teaching us that it should be true of us now. That we're to be stable now. That we're to be changeless now. In our piety. In our commitment. And we love people like that, don't we? People who are always the same. Always welcoming. Always willing to talk. Always willing to listen. We love that consistency and stability in God's people. And so we're to desire... That God will so work that stability in us 
that when people ask us round for supper, they'll not be wondering which David is going to turn up that evening. The features of living stones. Secondly, the formation of living stones. Verse number five, like living stones are built up a spiritual house. The stones in this paragraph, believers, are not left lying out in the open fields. They're collected and they're formed into a house. In Ulster, we build walls erected from stones collected in fields. And so Christians in, in this simile are gathered into the church of Jesus Christ with its membership, its worship, its sacraments, its fellowship. And for the early, early readers, this was an amazing statement. Can we enter for a moment the first century world? For the Christian Jewish readers of this letter, and there were some, the house, the most important house for them had been the temple in Jerusalem. The temple lay at the very heart of their worship. And for the Christian Gentile readers, they too had an important house in their pre-Christian life. That was the temple of Artemis in Ephesus. One of the seven wonders of the world. And it lay at the heart of pagan worship in Asia. So this statement is powerful. You are built up a house. Jews and Gentiles being brought together into this new house, into this house of God, the church of Jesus Christ. It's called a spiritual house, not only in the sense that it's different from the house of Artemis and the house of God in, 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 in Jerusalem, but it's also in the sense of it being indwelt by the Holy Spirit. In these new believers, the Holy Spirit, like the Shekinah cloud in the Old Testament, dwelling in, in that ancient house, indwells these new believers. They're people of the Spirit, and dwelt and inhabited by the Spirit in God's house. And they are people of worship and service to be a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This is a house of praise, a house of worship, a house of service that, that we're being built into, a house of glorifying and honoring God just as the Old Testament priesthood was set aside to do, to light the candles, to offer the sacrifices, to teach the people. Christians in the New Testament church have taken on that priestly role to offer praise to God to learn his word, to serve, and to honor him. The formation of the living stones taken out of the world and built in to this spiritual house. And there's two applications of this for us, isn't there? And one is that of being a worshiping people, of praising God. We're in this spiritual house, this temple and its purpose and role is to praise and to worship God. One of the great changes which the, the Reformation brought uh, to, to the church was that, that every believer is a priest. We do not have to confess uh, to any man. We bring our prayers directly to God. And within the congregational setting, they argued that it was the right and the privilege of every member of the congregation to sing praise unto God. This was not the, 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 the unique aspect of a choir or of leaders of the church, but that all believers, because they are priests, built into this spiritual house, this temple to worship God, could join together in the praise of God in congregational singing. So we value this privilege of being in God's spiritual house. But a second implication of this 
is fellowship. These stones, these living stones, they're all connected. They belong to each other. They're all part of the whole. And they all have a role of of holding up each other and depending on each other, just as the stones in our walls and buildings do. There's stones above, there's stones beneath. They uphold others and they depend on others. This aspect of being built together in the spiritual house emphasizes our fellowship in Jesus Christ. I love to hear of members phoning one another to see how they are. It was brilliant this morning watching a member of our church waiting on another member to ask them about their time away. Living stones connected to one another. Last night we were talking about Samuel Rutherford uh, to the young people and he was a minister in the west of Scotland uh, for for a time, for nine years, uh, and he was summoned from there to attend a a court trial in Edinburgh. Isn't that right, boys and girls? And it was 100 miles from his church in Anworth to Edinburgh to the high court. And he walked it, but he didn't walk it alone. Members of his congregation walked with him. They upheld him as living stones in the one building. And after a three-day trial, he was banished to Aberdeen, 200 miles from Edinburgh, and members of his congregation walked with him those 200 miles, living stones in God's spiritual house. This point is emphasized for us in our confession of faith in the 26th chapter, that chapter on the communion of saints. And it emphasizes the two dimensions that we've been thinking about, the living stones relation to God and the living stones relation to to one another, to other believers. This is part of what it says, being united to one another in love. They have communion in each other's gifts and graces and are obliged to the performance of such duties, public and private, as to conduce to their mutual good, both in the inward and outward man. It's a rich three paragraphs on the communion of saints. It covers a whole range of the aspects of the truth that we're thinking of just at this moment. It uses phrases like our communion in the gifts and graces of other believers and our performance of the duties that we have towards them as living stones in the one spiritual house. It talks about public duties and private duties. It talks about ministering to the inward man and to the outward man. Here's an unpacking for us in our confession of this simile that we're thinking of, that we are living stones in God's spiritual house. And in our midweek meetings uh, over the, the coming months as we think together about nurturing our children, This is an outworking of our relationship within God's spiritual house. That we will depend on one another for the other's input and wisdom. We will uphold one another in the particular challenges that one another is going through in parenting. We'll pray for each other, support each other, love each other because we belong to this spiritual house as living stones. Ephesians 3, the apostle is writing about the love of Christ which cannot be comprehended by us. But he's praying that the believers will comprehend the love of Christ, that we will know its length and its breadth and its depth and its height. He says the love of Christ surpasses knowledge. So how can this be squared? How can his prayer be answered and fulfilled? How can we comprehend the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge? 
It's a massive subject, a deep subject, an immense subject. A key phrase in answering that question is, in that chapter, in that prayer, with all the saints. This massive subject we will get further into, not on our own, in our study, in our house, on our knees, with our open Bible, but with all the saints. And parenting, and caring for the children of our church, which is the duty of every church member in Newton Arts, is a massive practice, an immense subject. And how will we get a handle on it? How will we develop in our skill in doing this? In the same way, with all the saints, the formation of living stones, and thirdly, the foundation of living stones. In verses 6 to 8, for it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. The third dimension of living stones is the foundation of the stones. What all these stones in the spiritual house are, are depending on. This solid, immovable cornerstone, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a critical aspect, isn't it, Urban? Yes, of any building, the cornerstone, the foundation. And here, focus is given to it. Jesus Christ, the cornerstone, upholding all the living stones joined together. And in these three quotations from the Old Testament, from Isaiah 8, Isaiah 28, and Psalm 118, the foundation stone, the cornerstone, is identified in relation to three parties. Firstly, to God. The word in the quotations which describe his relation to God is chosen. God has chosen the cornerstone of the church. Chosen him the Lord Jesus, to be the prophet of the church, to reveal God, to be the priest of the church, to offer the sacrifice, to be the king of the church, to rule over the church. He has chosen the cornerstone. And so it's all about him, not about us. He upholds us. He blesses us. He builds the church. Some of our choices have been poor. Choices have been bad. Choices have been ill-informed, badly researched. That car we paid a fortune for that was unreliable. That horse we bought at the auction that was lame. That night class that we signed up for, which was an absolute torture. God's choice. What a choice. Doesn't that comfort us in this new year? He always chooses what is best. In relation to believers, the word in relation to them is precious. And preciousness has the elements both of rarity and then possession. The rare Picasso painting, the rare Bentley classic car is precious by virtue of its rarity and its value. But most precious, if you own it, Jesus is the only Savior. But his preciousness is immense because he's our Savior. And we delight and we rejoice in him. To unbelievers, the word used from these quotations is stumbling, a rock of offense. This cornerstone, this foundation of Christ's church, precious to believers, chosen by God, is a stumbling to unbelievers. He's a bother to them. He's an embarrassment to them. He's a nuisance to them. He's a fanatic to them. He's deluded in their opinion. He's in the way of their life and their pleasure. He's a stumbling stone to them. He's a rock of offense with his demands and requirements and invitations. But despite their opposition and unbelief, Peter adds in that they're bizarre 
and godless and reckless behavior was destined by God. The foundation of the living stones chosen, precious, stumbling. And we need to remember more Jesus, our foundation, needs to be more of our focus. Our eyes need to be more on him. I didn't know that in the latter years of Rutherford's life, I always thought he was brilliant and amazing, not just because he was Scottish, but because uh, he, he wrote wonderfully. But in his latter years, there was a lot of controversy he didn't like Oliver Cromwell, and he didn't like King Charles II, and he fell out with many people in his church and was disliked by many. And his political opinions overflowed into his preaching and colored his sermons with controversy. And they began to weary his congregation in St. Andrews. He was principal in St. Mary's in St. Andrews. He was professor of theology in St. Andrews and he preached regularly in the local church. But there was one moment in that period of his life when he was preaching a sermon that had been full of political controversy and there was 15 minutes left in the sermon, and everybody knew this because they always flicked on an hourglass and the sand would run down in the hourglass. And when the sand came to the end, the minister usually stopped. 15 minutes left in the hourglass. And inexplicably, Samuel Rutherford began announcing titles of Jesus one after the other. Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, the Rose of Sharon, the Bright and Morning Star, the Lord of Glory, the Bread of Life. And on and on he went, announcing these incredible titles of Jesus, and he paused for a moment to get his breath. And at that very moment, quick as a flash, a noble man stood up in the church, and said to him, stop, you've got it right there. Rutherford had lost it, taken his eye off Christ, focused on the controversy and on the bricks and living stones all around him. All he could see was the defects and the failings and the inconsistencies in his brothers and sisters in the Christian church. But in that moment, he realigned his vision, the focus on the glorious, on the wonderful, on the majestic foundation of the church. And we can get consumed with the bricks, not doing their bit, not pulling their weight, failing us, and we can forget the foundation, Jesus he never fails us. We can be, re we need to study him. We can be deranged by doubt. We need to focus on him. We can be assaulted by temptation. We need to rely on him because his beauty outstrips the beauty of our sin or any idol. So let's be like infants today, growing but let's also be like living stones, stable, firm, settled, dependable. And if not yet a Christian, make Jesus the cornerstone of your life. Trust in him, not in health, not in wealth. All of those things pass so quickly and fade so easily. There's only one rock and solid foundation for us to trust for on in this life and in the life to come. Put your trust and hope and reliance on the Lord Jesus.